three, two, one. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Uncovering Hidden Commercial Costs. I'm Dave Irwin, and this is the fifth in a series of webinars we have been providing post-COVID that I have been part of with Scott and Brian Lambert and many other important contributors and guests over the last several months. Today, we are going to cover the cost side of the sales and marketing equation, specifically how to inventory and calculate all the different costs associated with the wide range of efforts companies undertake to improve sales. The problem is these efforts place more burden on sales and cost far more than most realize. How does this happen? What factors are at play that trigger all of these activities? How many initiatives are in play right now at your company that are driving the creation of more sales material? Is there a single person overseeing and harmonizing all of these activities and their costs? Most would agree that if you could repurpose non-valuable or duplicative costs to invest in valuable activities that move the needle with customers, that would be a good thing. So why is it so difficult to make that happen? These are all questions we will explore today. Scott Santucci has been talking about this topic for over a decade and has performed many analysis of hidden costs. He has helped technology firms save hundreds of millions in expense annually without reducing headcount by tackling this problem head on. Think about that. How many silos and departments and reasons to launch sales activities are there in a given year? With so much focus on a go-to-market approach where more newly acquired customers is the primary and overwhelming focus, when sales are down and pipelines are blowing up, it's natural people spend more money to support sales. But are these the right activities to make a difference? That's the question that needs to be asked. In a previous webinar, Routes to Value, we talked about the fact that only 11% of sales conversations are perceived as valuable by buying executives. Why is that? It's because customers want to have different conversations that, than ones based on products. This is the essence of the problem we call productitis. Productitis, productitis causes a lot of problems in the amount of sales and marketing costs that adds up to a high SG&A expense on the income statement is one of them. So let's dive into this great body of work Scott has been working on for over a decade. Scott, it's all yours. Thank you, Dave, and good morning and afternoon for everybody participating. Uh, what I'd like to do is highlight, here's uh, to get the most out of the listening of pleasure, listen light, lightly. Uh, imagine it's a TV show, listen lightly, you're going to have the opportunity to go into details. There's a lot of details. There's a lot of content that we're going to share. You're going to get a recording. You're going to get the slides. And you're also going to have links. Please check in the chat. Uh, Brian and Dave are going to be available to chat. We're building on a lot of different content. So some of the topics that we're going to reference are topics that we've covered before. You will have links to those to have information as well. Our goal here is to equip you both with philosophical concepts because that matters actually, even with finance, you think finance is concrete, but they have different philosophies on how, how, you, can, uh, how you can capture costs, what those costs actually look like and how to navigate all this stuff because we know full well that a lot of these conversations are political, they're highly charged and uh, there's different ways around them, but you have to have the right foundation. So having said that, please feel free to you know, jump in and uh, again, remind yourself, we're gonna cover a lot of content. You can watch this again over and over again and the recordings are, are, are very, very structured and very good if you're familiar with Zoom. Okay, so as always, what we like to do in our, in our series is earn the right to tell a story and we do that by paying out what we're gonna tell you. So one, your company is actually set up to create burden for your salespeople. The way that you're organized, the structure that you've got, your company is spending too much money to support its sales for, uh, people, which not only is it costly, but it also creates uh, an, an extra amount of burden and confusion for sales and customers. So in other words, the things that you're doing actually are contributing to make things harder. The second, thing, second uh, point that we're gonna tell you is that you need a completely different approach to evaluating commercial spending. And I know that's gonna seem frustrating or, or difficult to, to ascertain because we have a lot of different metrics that we've etched into our brain as rigid. 
I'm going to introduce different basic bo uh, budget models. Essentially, companies who follow tradition traditional budget-based methods, so this is the philosoph philosophical part I told you about, um, to manage sales and marketing costs, create bias that overly scrutinizes the sales force while providing less accountability for other departments. So think about that for, for, for a minute as we uh, share some more of the materials. And the last thing is how can you be empowered to address it? We have a, a relatively simple framework after you've, uh, after you've done the modeling. So we're gonna provide you two tools. One is a model to help calculate these costs. And the second is a framework to help simplify or organize these costs. But by following a framework to organize these costs, you can empower management to shift its view from managing sales and marketing as separate cost centers into investment for commercial growth. I know those, those might for us sound like words. I, will, I promise you, at executive br briefings time and time and time again, when I throw out that idea of why are you managing sales and marketing as separate cost centers? Should you be managing them as investments? And then I shut up. CFOs love that concept and they're just not thinking that way. So these are things that we might take for granted, but our, our counterparts in other organizations de definitely don't. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell a story. So as, as, as you've become accustomed to our webinar series, we like to break it down into three parts. The first part is let's challenge what we don't know. So I love this quote, hopefully you love it too. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So let's tackle the first one, what you know for sure. Come on, Scott, how other people spend their money doesn't affect me or my role. So you might be channeling your inner VP of sales. All I care about are the costs that are in my budget in my department, the costs that marketing does or human resources does or product does, they don't really affect me or my role or my performance. That's just them spending money. Well, that just ain't so. When executives start to look at sales and marketing as investments in revenue growth, they shift their fo focus to optimizing results. This is the tricky part about accounting. When you put money into a budget and you hold somebody accountable for the budget, that's one thing. But when you think about financials and that simple line that sales and marketing expense item, every, all of the costs factor in. Every dollar that's associated with sales and marketing expense gets accounted for in that light item. So these are the things that, that matter. When you start focusing on that expense at the OPEX expense line, they matter. So why am I bringing this up? We've referenced this. I'm going to go through these slides very, very quickly. As you may know, we've been working with uh, TCV, a private equity firm, to better understand what investors might be looking at in this uh, COVID or post-COVID world. And they've come up with this me measure called the commercial ratio. The commercial ratio is a metric for investors to evaluate the overall performance of your organization. Uh, Brian's going to send you links uh, so you can go check out links to learn more on this. We have a variety of topics. We've already covered this in depth. I just want to frame out why it's so important to make sure that you're really good on uh, connecting the costs. And that measure of that engine, it's not a predictive measure. It's not a prescriptive measure. What it is is a measure of how well you're performing. And what TCV wants to do, and they've rolled this out to 60 of their companies already, and it's in use today. What they do is they, they work with the executive team to figure out what those ratios are. They want their commercial engines running in the green zone uh, in between 0.75 and 1.25 a commercial ratio. I'll, I'll bring that to life more with a specific example here in a minute. But that's really what they're, what they're looking at. And what we've found is that most companies operate at a commercial ratio of below 0.75. And what that means is that it's unsustainable. Scenarios like this are rife with waste, inefficiency, uh, the, the environment is highly reactive, and it's conflict driven. Um, so what you don't want to do is you don't want to be in an operating environment like that. We don't want to be in that as human beings. If, if, you're not a, if you're not a math person, if you're a human being and, and like to work a certain way, no one thrives in that kind of environment. And guess what? Customers don't have great experiences that way either. So to go through a calculation, here's a, to bring this a little bit to life and frame it out of what we're gonna talk about with cost specifically, is here's an example of one SaaS company. 
uh, as you can see, I'm not going to go through all the metrics here, but uh, their commercial ratio is 0 0.51. If they were at 1.0, if you were to look at their, if you were to look at their metrics, they could be spending eight, eighty-two million dollars less. Now, the thing that I'd like to highlight for you: all of our companies are concerned with EBITDA, and if you look at their baseline, their EBITDA is 2.3 million dollars. If we pocketed all of that cost savings, the increase of EBITDA from two. 0.3 million to 84.9 billion million is a huge, huge, huge impact. Now, obviously, you don't have to pocket or move all of this, this the spending directly to margins. You can reinvest it. This is just Ill illustrative of how getting your costs in, in order matters. Okay, so what we're going to focus in on is on the cost side. So there's different ways that we can, we can look at it, but let's really break down these costs because there's a lot of costs that go into sales and marketing. So the next belief that we want to tackle is what you know for sure, is sales operation teams have been focusing on dri driving productivity for a long time. Um, they know what metrics to focus on and uh, that have the most meaning and the most, most levers. Well, that just ain't so. Uh, most sales departments are over-rotated or heavily focused on driving activity. So when we talk about productivity for most sales organizations, it's the activity of doing more stuff for less time. It's the stuff that's the focus on and the activity that's focused on. What's interesting is if we, uh, we're going to make a case in this, in this webinar that the shift of buyers demand more value less volume, more value, and we're not doing enough of that. So essentially what we're arguing is the whole idea of productivity being about um, activity and time is over-rotated to volume and that they're missing the tectonic shifts in the marketplace. So let's, play, let's pay that argument out in a second here. So as I think we all know universally on this call, that the customer world is changing dramatically. There's increased complex, they have, their problems are increasingly complex. There's cross departmental funding. There's many stakeholders involved. There's expanding focus on audits and risk. There's expanding roles of procurement. There's increased vendor options. I could go on and on and on and on. And that would be a whole webinar and upon itself about the changing customer environment. Well, however, on the other side of the equation, the world inside your company is also increasingly complex. How many times do you change your business model or reorg? Uh, how many different kinds of ways can solutions be configured? How siloed are products and services and even training or other departments? How inconsistent is messaging and content across the whole board to be able to deliver back to those customer needs? How much increased administrative burden is put on salespeople? There's just way too much technology being thrown or, 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 or batted about. And um, that, that would be over, there are over 500, depending on how you define it, there are between over 500 and 1,000 different technology companies that provide support for sales and marketing or sales enablement. Then we get into uh, how you go to market, put salespeople on islands. So when you think about the whole go-to-market approach, you have your sales model, and that's complex. You have inflexible structures, uh, unclear accountabilities. There's a whole amount of focus on job design, which also has complex structure, inflexible model, unclear accountability. And then there's a whole uh, point of focusing on the individual and their own complex structures, um, inflexible models, and unclear accountability. So there's all these different structural points about the expectations of the individual, the expectations of the job design, and then also the overall sales model. So when you put it all together, what happens is it creates this friction. The overwhelming majority of the script that comes from the green, uh, the green side, is about us, is about you, it's about your company, it's about your products and services. Some sales, sales uh, organizations are trying to ask their salespeople to sell to value or communicate customer uh, customer viewpoints, but it's very difficult when the green side is um, so about yourself and there's not enough illumination on the blue side on the customer side. So what we're really highlighting here is this inefficiency at this point of sale, how do we calculate what those costs are? The other problem is this obviously is inefficient. 
I mean, we can just picture it out without doing any math, right? I mean, it's just unbelievable how difficult it is. The bigger, a bigger challenge, and one of the things that we're challenging everybody on this call is who's actually responsible for these people's success. Now, I know you're going to say, well, that's probably the sales leader's uh, responsibility, but I'd like you to hold that off to the side for a minute and let us make the case of all the people involved. Does the sales leader have the responsibility to make all the decisions that are in the green? Who are all of these people making decisions in the green? So just hold that off, off, off to the side. And that's why this question is such an important point. Okay, so let's start talking about what does the what is this cost of productitis in the first place? What does it cost? Well, here's what it costs. Well, said specifically, here's what it costs one company. What this costs your company is gonna look differently and we'll get into more of the details of this model, but we've performed this analysis and on our first webinar, we walk through uh, more detail about this one analysis. We're gonna go through it again uh, a little bit further, but we just wanna want this, this point to just sit there for a bit. Product Titus could be costing $502,000 per rep per year. You're spending $502,000 per rep per year to create that product Titus cloud. That is not efficient. So what are, our what are our reactions when we do the analysis? We get two typical types of reactions. Um, when, we, when we present it to executives, some executives say there's no way that's, uh, that's um, hyperbolic. There's no way that's, that's what, what we're spending. And then the other side of the coin is, so what should this be? So throughout the course of this, I've got some check-ins along the way to, say, to pay out each of those questions so that you can start anticipating, if you did do this analysis, what kinds of conversations you might have with executives. So I'm focusing now on the no way. So that I'm addressing the no way question, so I'm forgetting about the, the, the person who's uh, asking what should it be for a second. These mason jars represent categories of activities. Just let them sink in a little bit and imagine these as activities going on inside your company right now. Does it relate? You have packaging work going on, people working on competencies, pitch decks, people investing in sales uh, su subject matter experts. How many of you guys spend a lot of time on uh, quarterly business reviews? There are ROI calculators, go, uh, projects going on, maybe even multiple ones. There's a focus on onboarding. Coaching is a topic that a, a, a lot of us talk about in the sales enablement community. Account plans, technologies, trials, demos. It goes on and on and on and on. So we like to frame these out as individual jars of activities that uh, go on the shelf. So just imagine that for a second. Now let's just focus on just one of these jars. And I picked one that hopefully is innocuous, uh, win-loss. And let's just try to understand how much costs or what actually goes in, what's in this jar <laughs> that's, that's on the shelf, so to speak. So the first thing is we don't really wanna know. So I want you to imagine we've, we're taking this jar and we're put, turning around and we're tapping the back of it to make sure we get all the stuff that's in this, uh, this win-loss analysis out so that we can properly account for what's happening and what the benefits are. So we want what's inside the jar, not necessarily the jar itself. So if we start tapping that out, the first thing that we want to recognize is in order to do the win-loss in the first place, it consumes headcount. So yes, you could say you could outsource all of this activity and hire somebody to do it and then we'd have a different expense item, but you're gonna be using your own headcount. So that's time not spent doing other things. So here we've apportioned different slices of time for different people. Now, obviously, depending on how big the win-loss analysis is, it's gonna drive by how many salespeople, for example, are involved or how many, how many people in the proposal team. But this is just give you a slice of every time we do something, we're tapping into an expensive resource, which is the headcount. That's you. Your time is very valuable because you're an expensive resource for the company. 
Then what it also does is it, it tries the outputs create a variety of different decisions. Now, unfortunately, I haven't figured out the best way to visualize this, but each one of these decisions are going to beget more chars. So the analysis of the win-loss analysis is going to trigger the portfolio team to go do things or the marketing team to go do things or the human resource group or executives to go do things. And it's also going to produce a ton of deliverables. There's quality checklists, data assets, interview notes that people might want to have, research analytics and uh, research uh, recommendations. So you can see all of these things adding up. There's different ways that we can calculate what, what those costs are, as you can imagine. Uh, but just if you add these things up using a, 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 some simple math, this could be about, you could be chart, spending about 10,000 bucks per report. So that's just one jar. So where did these jars come from in the first place? What's the source? Do you just, you know, do they just come out of nowhere and they're just conjured up and put on the shelf? Well, they start inside your company. So let's just do a little bit of a narrative here. This is your company. You're a big company or you're, you're a company upon itself. Hopefully you're, you're, you know, you're global and you have a bunch of different activities. It starts with your CEO and ha they have a problem. So this quote could be, they've just gotten back from uh, an earnings call and uh, investors pushed them on, on profitability. In this case, it's we need to increase our new platform sales fast. It's way off plan. Whatever the, whatever the driver force is, there's always a driver force. Now, of course, the CEO or business unit leader doesn't really do anything. Things cascade down and there's always something else. You know what? On top of that, while we're at it, we also need to lower our cost of sales because <laughs> we're in a COVID world and because the revenues aren't happening, we have to do these new things, but also we have to balance our costs as well. And then that creates more, uh, more people. The human resources team uh, says, you know what, I'll get my team on helping with that. So they're going to either do one or two of those things where the sales, sales organization is going to say, I'm going to get my team on that. And if you can see, the jars are starting to accumulate. What kinds of initiatives are being launched as we speak right now happening but while we're on this call, boom, new, new jars are being demanded. The marketing team, the portfolio team, all of these different groups with their jars. And each one of those VPs are gonna delegate and they're gonna ask individual people, the people who report to them. So the sales person might ask the sales enablement people to say, well, we need to build a better playbook or the corporate marketing might say, well, uh, we need uh, we need more incentives, customer incentives to do this. We need a, a you know a call to action or or a benefit. Uh, account engineers working on the product side might say we need to have a better process of how we do demos. Uh, the learning and development group might might advocate well, we need better coaching. That's what needs to happen. So each one of these things are going to be launched in some way, shape, or form. A jar is born, if you will, and then those things get delegated down to other people. Uh, the directors also can delegate tasks to other manager people and they come up with their own individual checklists and their own activities like uh, I need to improve our ROI calculator or we need better personas. I need you to do that, Tim or, St or, or Steve or Sally. We do account-based marketing so we can do account-based plans that somebody learned about somewhere else. And then those get cascaded down to other people and so on and so on and so on. What happens then is you get all of these jars and the jars just keep piling up, piling up and piling up. So what happens then is what are the contents of the jars? Where are the contents of these jars actually located? So just imagine how would we go about tap the backs of all of these and unpack all of the things that are in the, in the jars in the first place. So where are these jars located? How do we actually figure out where they are? Well, the marketing team has their own place of, of, of organizing content or that one initiative that uh, no one wanted to do, say maybe the, the Bain, uh, Bain activity that everybody worked on to create lots and lots of stuff for some sort of sprint. Where is that housed if it's a cross-functional effort? Or you know that guy, Chad, he did some cool stuff, that sales engineer, where do we find that? So you have these different pockets or these different groups of where people are putting these jars. So think about these as different stores where you might want to go buy those jars. And they're all in different locations and they're all in different places everywhere. 
And then what happens is those outputs, remember the outputs, the deliverables that we talked about, they get packaged up, packaged up in, in, a, in a certain way. And really what it looks like is this. Hopefully you remember um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I wonder if this resonates with you. All that work, all that time, all the deliverables of the win-loss, they get put in the archive, in the ether, and then it's quote unquote there to just go find somebody. So if you think about all the crates and all the activities and all the mason jars that are stored away in all, these, uh, all of these package crates anywhere, is it any wonder where all of the costs come from and how all of this stuff adds up? So how are we doing on, the, on that question, the 502,834? Well, typically when I go through this narrative, the person who says there's no way the costs are that much, I'm listening now. The other guy, <laughs> the person says, so what should it be? Well, you haven't answered my question yet. And I acknowledge that person in the, in the dark gray, uh, person in the pig, I'm glad you're, you're, you've, you've joined our conversation. Okay, so now we get to the next part. Def the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different result. So what we're saying here is we've got to have a different approach. We can't keep doing things the same way, which means we can't keep looking at uh, costs through only budgets or only departments. We can't keep doing more and more activity. Somehow this stuff needs to be orchestrated or coordinated or, or congealed. So how do we go about doing something different? Well, here's something different. You have a friend in finance. What's interesting is this option of partnering with the finance department to figure out uh, new ways of, of, of categorizing costs and figure out spending, getting control of the random acts, for most people are intimidated by that. But you know what? Finance is really a fantastic referee. And if you're talking about this and you're thinking about this and that's never gonna work inside my organization, well, it does work. You just have to have a different strategy. And what finance is, is a great referee. We're, we are going to have to have a conversation with finance to get over this idea. And that's why I alluded to earlier on the concept of saying to the referee, hey, let's call the, 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 the head of finance, Mike. Hey, Mike, let's imagine sales and marketing as investments in growth and not treat it as cost accounting. Now, Mike is going to freak out a little bit on you and say, oh my gosh, are you proposing activity-based costing? And we are using activity-based costing principles, but we're not proposing activity-based costing. We don't want anybody to fill out timesheets. Let's just take that off the table right now. What we've got is a different approach, and we'd like to walk you through that. Mike is going to be a huge friend of yours because Mike sees all of these numbers, and Mike sees the world like the matrix in ones and zeros, and the rest of us uh, have to see pictures and things like that. So Mike becomes a great advocate. Mike doesn't know what techniques that we need to do. Mike doesn't know how to correlate activities to results. That's what he wants your expertise for. So Mike becomes, Mike needs you as much as you need Mike. We just have to get over the fact that we have to have a different conversation. So let's talk like Mike a little bit, or let's get prepared to talk like Mike a little bit. This is a discipline that folks in the sales enablement um, community, we just don't have and we really need if we wanna be able to talk to Mike. Let's ask this question. What is your company spending on sales enablement? In order to uh, break this down, the first thing that we have to ask is, so what counts as sales? Is it the total revenue that we're measuring? Is it salespeople and advocate? Is, is that what we're looking at? or are we looking at a specific sales transaction? And what's interesting is if you look at the results, I do a lot of surveys of the sales enablement world, we're all over the place. Um, some want us to focus on revenue, some focus on coaching individual reps. So we have to make sure we're really concrete if we wanna to talk to Mike to have a frame of reference. The second thing, so one thing that I, I have learned is that in talking to Mike, uh, I, I like to break the, the, the measures down and saying what we're looking for is the cost. Remember that blue person, that salesperson? You're investing a lot of money in that sales resource. 
What we're after is what is the cost in the green to support that sales resource. So our focal point of what we're focusing on the spending is salespeople in aggregate. In other words, quota carrying reps, period. That resonates with CFOs. So now the second thing is we have to figure out what pools of spending are we interested in. So what counts as enablement spending? Do we want to look at the total sales and marketing OPEX spend? By the way, that's what the commercial ratio picks up. I don't think we need to do that right now uh, because that's probably a bridge too far. Um, do we focus on the budget of the sales enablement department? Frankly, that would be foolish because there's no sales enablement department out there that's the same. Everybody has different scope and span and control. And also we're playing back in that same sort of budget thing. So really the answer is uh, the happy medium is anything slated to quote unquote help sales. Okay. So what does that ratio look like and how do we get that number, the $502,000? We need to put things in the numerator. Sales enablement costs, AKA, anything slated to help sales. And then we need to put in the denominator, quota carrying salespeople, AKA salespeople in aggregate. As simple as this is, and staying dedicated to this is really important, what you're gonna find is a lot of questions. So for example, what actually counts as a quota carrying sales rep when you have a bunch of overlays? Where do you put the sales, the, 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 the sales uh, sale, frontline sales managers? Do you count them as quota carrying or do you count them as sales enablement costs? So that's why we need a model. So how do we break down and use that model and how would we categorize and what is the source of this, the, the productitis costs? So where does productitis come from? As we mentioned, what we're doing here is instead of looking things in jars, which is another way of siloing activities, it's pouring out all the contents in all of these different jars into this one thing. So you can see hopefully how that ball, that productitis ball is the accumulation of all of these things that are unorganized and uh, uh, lack of focus. So what we're really highlighting is the reason I went through it is now some of you are going to rightly point out, well, we should be working backwards to the customer. And I'm going to tell you, you don't have any financial models right now to even begin to do that. So that's a, a, a concept that's correct. It's a bridge too far when we're talking this way. What we can do though, so that's why if, if you remember this picture, that's the, what we're highlighting is the things on the left where the green is, those are the costs that we're trying to articulate. And the impact that we're trying to show is what's on the, sale, the back of the salesperson. So if you think about all of the structural costs that go into it versus the investment costs, which would be things in the green. So think about just that simply. So to, be, uh, to simply, simplify this, there are ways that we would, when we pour the contents out of the jars, you put them into each of these different buckets. The first bucket would be costs of structure of sales. By the way, most companies do a very good job of organizing their costs there. So most companies will be able to tell you their, what their cost of sales and people will be able to think about it in terms of the sales structure costs and the sales budget. Where they're fuzzy on are all of the support of sales costs that come from product groups, marketing groups, all those executives who say, I'll get my team to go do that. That's all money spent. That's all money spent on commercial, commercial costs. So what we're highlighting here is if you can kind of imagine that picture before, everything on the left, the support costs, that's green. That was that green picture. Everything on the right, the support structure, the su structure of sales is the blue. And we're examining the left, not so much the blue. Now within that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk down, I'm gonna simplify and walk through how did we calculate or how did we arrive at that 500 and, uh, 502 number. So what you're gonna see at the top are different categories. Think about these categories as different bins. Remember the example of the crate from um, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Imagine these as different crates of how to just take out the spend for each of these jars. So what we wanna do is we wanna have simple, simple categories and these categories exist because we're working across charts of accounts. I, I, I've debated about having some slides in here to show you guys what charts of accounts are, 
but some organizations are so decentralized that they have literally 30,000 charts of accounts for sales and marketing. And I'm not kidding. Um, and that's been more than one company that we've worked with. That doesn't work, guys. Uh, it's just way too much. It's way too complicated to do an analysis. So we've developed this approach in working with other CFOs and, and, and finance people. So there are common ways to group categories of costs into these buckets. So the first thing is you can see, because we're not interested in calculating the spend on the structural costs, but we need to be able to put those in buckets so we know what spending to not do and what spending to concentrate on, the costs of the base salary of the quota carrying reps, the benefits of the quota carrying reps, the infrastructure uh, costs or their acquisition costs, those things are costs, yes, but are they costs of the, uh, of, of the hidden commercial costs? No, they're not part of that analysis. Then there's variable costs. So each time you hire a salesperson, they consume resource. Um, so they are definitely consumers of, of resource. So they consume resource by commissions. Every time they sell something, you gotta pay an extra. Uh, there are incentive programs that you put in place uh, for, for salespeople. You wanna send your best reps to, uh, to Cancun. Uh, there's reporting costs that you have to do that you, that, that you overlay. And this is where things get interesting. After that, you have other things like travel and entertainment. Every company can choose to decide that. So in this particular company, they wanted to factor in travel and entertainment because being a technology company, they thought they could do a better job of uh, using uh, virtual meetings to reduce their, their travel costs. I wanna highlight, this has been the saving grace for COVID for a lot of companies, and we're gonna see a lot of change moving forward in, in travel costs. And this is a great opportunity, by the way, as a side note, for anybody on this call to get ahead of things and how you can do things more virtually, particularly with, with, with customers. So that became part of, the, part of the analysis here. So we found that that's um, $186,000 per rep based on all the travel costs divided by the denominator. Now, when we go over here on the development costs, what we wanna factor in is what's the overhead. So what we typically find, and we not run into a company yet that, would, that uh, disagrees with this, the overhead costs are sales management that's non-quota carry. So you're gonna say, well, the frontline sales managers have a number, but we don't like to double assign a quota. So we pick up the sales management costs. Uh, and we treat that, that number that they have as an incentive or as a target, not as a quota, because we can't double assign a quota. So therefore, your frontline sales managers are picked up as overhead. Your VPs of sales are overhead. Sales operations, sales enabling, all those other people are treated as overhead. And when you do that, it creates some great questions about, well, what, why do we have frontline sales managers in the first place? What are we getting from them? That's a completely different topic and maybe a different webinar. But when you start looking at all the different categories, what are the mason jars that go into performance improvement? What are all the mason jars that go into training and education? As a side, this particular company had 37 different independent training activities going to salespeople. When you go in, when we went in and talked to them about it, they didn't believe that. Of course, there's no way that's the case. I guarantee you, if you go do the auditing and, find, and follow the money, you will find lots of independent people providing tra direct training to salespeople that isn't coordinated. And yet we blame salespeople for their lack of performance. Then when we go, so those would be the developmental costs. So these developmental costs you're gonna find in a sales organization and also with human resources groups, uh, maybe even some product groups uh, providing product training. Now we have the category of scaling, and these would be more tools to help drive conversations with salespeople, more of the marketing costs and things like that. So you can see we're dumping in win-loss analysis, pipeline forensics, case studies, other things into the mix. So there's the overhead there. That's all of the headcount associated that work on those projects. So that might even be, we'd have to, to allocate even a little bit of the spending uh, for a business unit uh, people are participating in that. We're accounting for all of the demand generation. We're sorry, we don't see a difference between demand generation, prospecting and sales enablement to us and to finance people. It's all spending spent to, uh, to help support sales. Then there's a variety of sales support services. Of course, we're sticking in uh, as part of that 
any overlay or evangelist or subject matter expertise uh, experts who are accounting for things there. And of course, all the collateral and tool that goes into it. And as if you can see, when you look at these different categories and it's nice and neat and clean, there's, way, there's easy ways to go and assess what those things look like, you get to $502,000 pretty quickly. Now, again, this isn't your analysis. Your analysis is gonna look different. We'd have to make sure that we map to what your accounting models and everything are. So every, the finance is completely, uh, completely happy with, uh, with, with, the, with the structure. But I can guarantee you this, the amount that you're spending to support sales, activities in the black or in maybe the blue are way higher than what you think. So how much is spent per rep? This is the 502,834. So what should it be? So let's pay out that last question here. So what should it be? The reason that we bring up that commercial ratio is that if you wanna be in alignment with the optimum metric, which is 1.0, well, this is what this company should be spending it on. They should be spending 246,388, not 502,000. And basically what that is, is the difference between the two. All of this is worked out in spreadsheets, not really uh, uh, keen for a webinar. So what does that do? That pays out the question of what should it be? And what does it do? Remember the guy who was like, ah, there's no way it's that much, <laughs> that much money? Well, guess what? We've sold them now <laughs> so much that they wanna move quickly into, oh my gosh, how do I fix this right now? And that creates a tremendous amount of uh, momentum for, for driving change. So let's do that. Let's go into the last part and answer that. How do we go and drive that change? What can you do uh, to drive that change? And that's why we talk about this quote here from Winston Churchill. Never let a good crisis go to waste. You have this amount of spending that's going on. You've got a clear uh, rationale of why it happens. So digest it, come up with your own plan. What can you do about it? Well, the first thing that you wanna do is calculate the costs. So this is you, you can go be a superhero to go tackle it. You don't have to just brunch in and do it all at once, role play it out a little bit, talk to some people, uh, socialize it a bit, but you wanna calculate those costs. So what do you do next? Well, the first thing that you need to do is you have to have the right mindset. In order to combat productitis, if you do the analysis, you've gotta be prepared to move fast. So we've talked about this before, uh, we don't want to reinforce it. You have to have the mindset of being an orchestrator. You don't want to have the department. Uh, you don't want to be the person that says, well, I want to have a department and this is what I own. What you're doing is you're orchestrating a variety of things. So what is your mission and goal going to be to highlight what the, what the cost should be? How do you prioritize the right things to focus on at the right moment? How would you collaborate on this, say, with, with your head of finance? What would your head of sales say? What would your CMO say? How do you get people on the same page to where they just don't start yelling because no one likes the yelling? How do you create a narrative by confronting reality? The reality of this webinar is pretty straightforward. It's everybody's reality. We should just talk about it instead of not talking about it. And most companies don't talk about it because they don't have a mechanism to talk about it with. You wanna drive results by design, not effort. I've walked you through a variety of different designs. I'm gonna reinforce those here for you but you wanna be thinking about how do I have a design or approach instead of just doing stuff. You wanna unlock and create, uh, unlock energy and create momentum. Having a storyboard for how you talk about this stuff is really important. You have to recognize that you, uh, you will trigger frustration from your CFO and that frustration is actually great because now they're really engaged in thinking things through and they become such a great ally if you can handle a few common questions, which we can help you be, get prepared for. And then you wanna catalyze this change through collaboration, which I'm gonna show you a model to it. And you have to think about this thing because think about all the different categories of mason jars. You have to think about the people involved and you're gonna to need to think about people in two ways. You're gonna to need to think about people in the human way, which most of us do already on, the, on this call, but you're gonna to have to be, be, think about people in the uncaring way also as headcount. And you have to think about both if you're gonna be able to have a good conversation with finance. Your job is to bring the human part of it to finance, but you have to do a little bit of the headcount viewpoint in order to actually get an audience with finance. You're gonna to have to think about process differently. Process isn't about how to get stuff done. Process thinking about how these things work across different functions. 
you're gonna have to think about different ways to categorize technologies and techn what's the use of technologies. And you're gonna have to think about information sources because tracking all of this information down requires discipline. So the first thing that you're gonna to need to do is go find your friend in finance. So let me give you some tips on who to look for. I'm not gonna talk in this call about how to look for them. You should be listening to our podcast uh, to, to, to learn to do that on orchestratesales.com. That's the one that I do with Brian. But you need to find a friend in finance. When I talk to CFOs, there's basically about only 20% of their organization can do this kind of analysis. There's themselves, and then there are what they call analysts. You're probably gonna wanna find an analyst to say, hey, uh, I have a great idea. Maybe this, Mike might be the CFO. Pete works for Mike. Hey Pete, I've got a great, I've got an idea. I'd like to run some things by you. Can we have a lunch or can we have a conversation? Keep it lightweight and get them engaged on curiosity. Don't pitch them a solution. You wanna get their, uh, get their help because boy, do they have a lot of value and help, help get you over the hump. So find a friend in finance. Don't, do not, do not try to find somebody in the cost accounting group or the person assigned to, to budget variants or, thing, or, or the people who just examine the pipeline and don't have the analysis function of it because they are too rigid and too much of an accountant and not an analyst. So that's a key point. Um, these are great tips that I've gotten from other CFOs. We'll share them with you. So the another thing to do is you need to have a model. So one thing that I'd like to highlight out, this is a plug for me and my, uh, my organization at, at Growth Enablement. If you see there, there's a spreadsheet. We actually have a model that, walks, that we walk through. So we have a, a way to easily calculate it. We plug in numbers uh, based on variables to help calculate and plug into each of these costs. We have a very easy methodology to walk through your finance department to calibrate your cost to each one of these different categories. And then we have a way to drive this model. And then we have a way to check our work with the finance department to make sure that this is accurate. When we produce our findings, we always co-produce with, uh, with an analyst. So basically, it, it, if Mike is the CFO and he's part of the receiving end, I would be co-producing findings with the, 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 the Steve guy or the Jim guy, the analyst who helped drive this analysis so he can answer the questions back to the CFO. This is an example of what, that, what all that looks like. Now, what do you do after the analysis? How do you get a whole bunch of people on board to start looking at it? Well, the first thing is if you've ever, when, when you go to a grocery store, all of those different jars of things that you're looking for are organized, right? <laughs> There's an aisle. Uh, you don't go uh, just to the cool, the, the chilled aisle, which, um, and, and try to find uh, ice cream and milk and cheese. Cheese is where cheese is. And then you pick from your different sources of cheese. Milk is where milk is. And you pick all your different choices of 1% uh, full, um, uh, lactose free, uh, organic, not organic. You make your choices, but you're, at least you're, you're in the milk aisle. Well, that's all we're saying here is step number one that you need to do is create a logical framework on how you're going to organize those shelves. And we've, are, we've got a starting point for you. We can all, you can always tweak these. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to organize those jars and put them on shelves. And the first thing is to make sure you have a logical model. So the logical model would be the sales model, would be what are uh, costs that are, what, what jars do you put on there to support the sales model? So think about that by being compensation plans or um, rules of engagement or other kinds of things that create costs. Uh, then you might say, well, what about organizational alignment? There's a whole bunch of friction that happens, say the marketing content isn't necessarily in the same way that the trainers might do or the salespeople might use, et cetera. Or there might be a measurement focus. Um, there's a whole bunch of measurement activities going on all over the place. Are those rationalized? Or what about skills and competencies work? Uh, there's a lot of judgment about what salespeople should be doing. Are any of those rationalized? Have, have you looked at the, the competency work from one to, to the other? Um, you probably haven't. And boy, if you looked and compared that work, you would be astonished at how, how different things were. Or put things into sales content, all the stuff that we're asking to put, ma match out the salespeople or engagement model or not, uh, knowledge management. These would be all different activities and you can change your own label to, to, to run your own store. This is just a starting point. The second thing that you wanna do is you wanna take 
inventory of these different activities. Uh, now, I recognize that this might be tedious work. Yes, it is tedious work, but that's the tedious work that gives you the power to be able to make these claims that we're highlighting. It took a lot of work to be able to produce the, the materials that I shared with you. It's lots and lots and lots and lots of interviews, and it doesn't need to be as difficult as it sounds, but you do need to do this. I will say one, for, for one uh, company that we, uh, that we did our analysis for, we literally printed out all of the materials here and stack and had them in the conference room when we brought the management in. And they were like, oh my gosh, what is that? It's sort of like the, um, um, the John Stossel, let's print out the tax code. And we said, that's all the information that you're pre pre presenting to sales. The reason that this stuff is so important to categorize this stuff is because it's just so hard to get your head around what we're doing to sales by having all these random acts. So to have some sort of strategy based on what's going to work for your, your, your management is important, but it starts by taking inventory. And maybe this does sound like AA, you know, to take personal inventory, but it works. It works for those people and it definitely works here. So the third thing that you want to do is highlight out and visualize, hey, um, do we have any duplicate activities? So just by calling out, now that we've done this inventory, that can be overwhelming, and that's the shock factor of just the sheer volume or, or lack of orchestration. You want to highlight out how many different win-loss analyses are going on inside your company right now from different departments. Are they standardized? Are they the same? Do they have the same, uh, do they have the design point? How many product portfolio certifications programs do you have? What about solution uh, presentations? Let's just call those things out and have a conversation. That's it. That's all we're asking to do at this stage is have a conversation. In most cases, this is how you, this is how you defray a lot of political uh, disagreement because once it's called out, once you realize, look, we have six different groups doing solution pr presentations here, here, and here. Could any of you use these? And then shut up. What happens is by, by, by raising the issue, you actually help pull people in to help you solve problems rather than create defensiveness. This is the value of having clarity. It allows you to uh, tackle tough problems. The next thing that you want to do is find and eliminate redundant efforts. So if you're also going to want to start putting these jars together into some sort of hierarchy. So if you have a set of client facing tools, for example, doesn't it make sense that the sales messaging fits within it instead of being separate or that you have the executive selling skills that are required to do that, that they're completely aligned or that the sales, uh, the sales guides and playbooks are completely integrated with the client facing tools. Shouldn't that be the, the, the design point? So you can start eliminating waste by having each of these things run in different pockets. So what's interesting is if you pulled all of your resources and say, let's build client facing tools with, and then subordinate the sales messaging, the credibility and credentials, the, the guides, the executive selling, the battle cars, the credibility credentials, the ROI case, and subordinate all of those, you're pooling the money and the money that you would have if you took all these things independently might cost you $300,000, $400,000 if you pull them together into one, uh, one program, first of all, it will be less money. You'll spend less money because things will be coordinated. And secondly, all of these things will be simplified, coordinated, and much more useful. Eventually, what you want to get to uh, is mapping all and coordinating all of these things into an integrated service. You're not going to be wanting to provide jars and, and content and everything like that. You're going to be wanting to provide this as an ongoing service. So in other words, the sales organization doesn't ask you for the jar. Uh, they ask you for the results associated with the client facing tool. And we need to be able to do this by plugging in the client facing tools with the sales strategy, the organizational alignment, all of these things can be orchestrated or pulled together under a service. Now, ultimately that's, uh, that's the end state uh, and how all of these things evolve together. Now, we've already provided you this framework. This is a transformation journey. We're not asking you to follow each of those steps all at once. Just do the low hanging fruit and find where the cost takeout is. Find, for example, do the work to get to the redundant efforts. I think you'll be surprised at how many millions of dollars you can share, save 
just by stopping doing things. Literally, just by stopping doing things, you can not only help improve your sales world, but by doing it from there. But what, you're, what we're really talking about in terms of this overall orchestration, this concept of moving to a service model, is that what you're gonna find is these pockets of mason jars and activities cluster around these areas that we've referred to before. So instead of trying to deal with all of the different mason jars and creating your own mason jars yourself, figure out ways to orchestrate. Do you orchestrate around pipeline enablement? What are the combination jar services that you need? How do you work with finance and marketing and sales to improve win late, shorter deal, to drive shorter deal size and larger deal sizes? What are the combinations of those jars? How do you configure them together? Ultimately, as you get more of these orchestration elements right, you can start moving to a, a commercial ratio. This is a phased approach. Maturity level one is dealing with the doer level. So I think you've heard me talk about sales enablement before being the head of broken things. There's a lot of broken jars out there. Then the next is evolving to the orchestrator part. That's what this process helps you catalyze this effort. And then ultimately moving to commercial enablement. So what do we cover? What do we cover today was your company is set up to create burden for salespeople. That's uh, what your structure is. That's why we need an orchestrator. Two, you need a different approach to evaluate commercial spending. That's what the model, that's what the, the financial model is and the idea of having a friend in finance. And then you need a framework to systematically optimize spending. That's what those sequence of events are. Putting things onto simple, simple um, um, ah, I've lost the word. Shelves, that's the word I was looking for. Putting things on simple shelves and then looking at it from there. So what can you do next? Let's talk. So talking through that structure is actually a very easy thing. F feel free to shoot me an email at scottsantucci at growthenablement.com and let's set up a conversation. Number two, register for our last in our, in our, in our series. Uh, our go to customer is how do we take all of these different webinars and research that we've done in the post COVID world and come to our conclusion. Our conclusion is that you need to build a go to customer model, not a go to market model because markets don't write checks, customers do. Join us on September 24th at 1 p.m. register today. And then finally, uh, you learn more. Um, as I've mentioned, Brian Lambert and I have a podcast inside sales enablement. You can find that and register and join all of those and find more of the resources that we've talked about, the ongoing dialogue visit orchestratesales.com. So thank you very much for your time and uh, time and attention. I'm gonna ask Dave to wrap us up and summarize uh, some of the things that were, were learned from the chat and by engaging with you all. Dave, uh, any, any thoughts or conversations of uh, what, uh, what was heard in the chat or any questions? Yeah, Scott, uh, just a couple things. And uh, we're at the top of the hour, but we'll stay on to answer a, a few questions that popped up. One of those, Scott, was about the sales production. So if you look at commercial ratio, right, it's looking at the aggregate view of all of the costs of sales and marketing, you know, tied to new growth in aggregate. Do you ever get into looking at the, uh, the cost per rep, the average cost per rep based on the production levels of different reps? In other words, is there a correlation between reps that, that are high performing and the, um, the use of all of these sales materials uh, compared to reps that are poor performing? Can you just talk about maybe the correlation or relationship between sales production and uh, cost per rep averages? Sure, Dave. Um, that's a tough question to ask, answer because um, right now I'm in the mode of uh, being very disciplined and structured. So let me answer it that way. The first step that you have to do is you have to be able to know, you have to be able to treat apples, apples and apples. You can't have apples and oranges comparisons. So the first thing we'd have to know is we'd have to have a classification of some sort of the, 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 the content assets, right? So in other words, we need to know which, what are the class of all, all of those jars that those top reps would be looking at. The second thing that we'd need to look at is exactly what is the definition of what those top reps are. 
Now, the reason that I bring that up is you'd have to uh, get agreement on your, your, your sales leadership, because if you just pull that data based on the way some sales operations group tackle it, which would be, uh, you know, uh, quota obtainment by, uh, by quarter, I'm really less interested in quota because what happens is your best reps get assigned more and more quota. So their quota obtainment is, you know, hovers around one, they don't blow it out. So we think people who are blowing out quota are our best reps. Um, please go back and look at what quota really means to you for your company. So in order, in order to answer that clearly, there's a lot of things that I'd need to unravel. Now, having said that, there is definitely a correlation between top reps and how they use resources. Top reps use more of the resources because they have a frame in their head, a framework in their head about how they connect the dots. One of the things that's so important, this is why we advocate this orchestration model, is the more you can build connections to help salespeople connect the dots with all of the stuff in the green, if you will, if going back to that metaphor of the people in the green, to uh, people in the blue, the better off you're gonna be. And that was really the whole key, key focus of our Rouse to Value uh, webinar, which uh, was, our, was our last one. Great. Another question I think is, um, talk a little bit about the dynamic of interfacing with a friend in finance and then leveraging that to align uh, the peers you have to sort of corral in, in marketing and product to participate in aggregating uh, these different costs. Um, does the finance uh, person help you sort of create a, a standard model that is, it makes it more receptive uh, for other people in the organization to participate uh, in this kind of effort? So there's, uh well, let's, let's break that down into two parts. There's, I, I think the first part is getting the courage or what do I say to that person in finance in the first place? I mean, let's be honest, most of the people in this call are pretty intimidated by financial language. That's why I went through this, uh, this model here is this is a very simplified way to teach everybody activity-based costing, budget analysis, and all that other stuff in a way that resonates with, 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 with financial leaders. The, the sequence of events happens this way. Um, finance people in, on, on the main are pretty conservative folks. So step number one is, hmm, I think this Scott guy's onto something here. Let me explore a little bit further. So you might have to have a, a call or two just to calibrate your, your understanding. But the next thing is, hmm, uh, I'm gonna go pull my own analysis. So let's do our own analysis. So that might be Mike saying to me, let's do our own analysis or let's hire somebody to go do that. And it, 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 that can be completely under the radar screen. And what they're gonna do is just it, it look at it and assess it. And then they're probably gonna sleep on it. I don't wanna necessarily sleep on it. What they're gonna be doing is mulling it. They're gonna be mulling from a bunch of different factors. One factor they're gonna be mulling it from would be, hmm, what might, how might I communicate this to our investors? What would be the impact? How might I communicate it to the different uh, bu budget teams? And another thing that he's gonna be uh, worried about would be what's gonna be the implication on our cost operating model. So there's a bunch of different factors that they're gonna think through and the more you can give them answers, uh, the better off they're gonna be. The third thing that they, that they do is now that they've thought through all of those different scenarios and now that you're, you're, you're providing the readout, oh my gosh, are they amazing? Because essentially what they do is they just provide the facts. Uh, the way that I, I, I like to think about it is when I'm doing these um, executive readouts, what happens is people will challenge you and the CFO will say that's inaccurate. It, it's almost like a, a robot readout of what the calculations are. And because they're the people that own all of the, you know, do all the dot connecting on the resourcing side, the, their credibility is just through the roof. So it allows you, it, it, it basically what happens is we're automatically discounted uh, of being folks close to sales as being hyperbolic on the executive committee. So the, to show up with a sober mathematical financial case and have the CFO back you is incredibly powerful. So those are the ways that it helps. The other way that they, they help is they're very, very helpful 
in providing a referee if you're if you want to do this and you want to just uh, say let's have a conversation um, um, there's friction with one individual department they're going to provide the referee and then they, if, if that choice needs to get escalated they'll provide their recommendation and they're always going to side on the fact that who has the best numbers Great. There, there's one one last uh, <clears throat> curiosity question on the 500 and 2,000 example uh, on the hidden cost uh, number tied to reps. Um, what was how many reps were there in that example, and or what was the average sales production output of the reps compared to that overall uh, number? That's a question that came up. Uh, specifically i don't know if you can recall or remember in general but uh right so uh one of the things that um what's interesting is you would assume that the or at least i would assume that a, a large company would have a lower uh cost per sale because the argument is we're operating at scale you know the um the law of economy e economic um um, economic influences kick in. And the, re the reality is what we find is that number increases the bigger the company there is. So in other words, the big companies are not getting, are, are, are not building a scalable sales support infrastructure. They're building, they're, they're, they're building individual piece parts that make it more com complex, which shouldn't be the case. Now, the reason that I highlighted out is uh, that $502,000 is shocking and it shocked the executive team of, of that company. And the first part of the conversation was, what is the denominator or the number of quota carrying salespeople? That in upon itself was difficult. So in that engagement, we fought through with the sales operations people, one number, and I had a different number from the annual report and we had HR and finance settle, the, settle that score. And really, the, the, the extreme difference was an argument between 20,000 and 10,000. And what's also interesting is once we broke that, down that analysis, what we found is that because other, other groups and the, the, the freedom that people had to create sales roles, they had over 525 different sales roles. Now think about that. How in the world are you going to support all that? And is that efficient on your sales structure side? And the answer is no, of course not. Now, the reason I bring that part up is it's, it, we need to first understand our different types of sellers because an inside salesperson, hopefully we're not spending that amount of money. Um, and then maybe, spend, maybe we should be spending more amount of money for our key accounts. The difficulty is in a one size fits all budgeting process, we can't make that analysis uh, um, more apples to apples. So that's the first thing that I want to share of what's important there. The second thing that I want to share would be the productivity per rep. Once you start classifying reps into their categories, like strategic accounts, named accounts, um, SMB, inside sales, et cetera. What's interesting is you still have that same, that same kind of 80, 20 uh, Pareto um, an analysis that, that happens anywhere. And your top reps are way, way more performing. So you want to look at those costs in relation to what, or what are you getting for your top reps versus the, the gen pop salesperson. Now, the reason that I highlight this, and I wish I had more slides to get into this, maybe I need to do a whole uh, webinar or, or a podcast breaking this down, is this analysis matters a lot because most people design the jars for the C and the D rep, but the return on investment is always on the A and the B rep. So if you don't know what your A and B reps are by sales segment, what happens is you overinvest in one area and underinvest in another where you get those returns. And the whole idea should be somebody needs to be responsible for moving D reps to C reps, C reps to B reps, and that mechanism doesn't exist in most, most cases. So finding out that correlation is important because we don't want to just say there's a cause and effect between spending and results because there isn't. What, what we want to highlight is what are the activities 
what are the uses, what are the behaviors, how do we put all of those things together and organize it into a service? Terrific. I mean, that's a great question, and that's a great question for a whole nother webinar. So whoever asked that, high five on that. I apologize for uh, not having more slides to break that down, but it is a, it's, a, it's a challenge. That's why you have to do all this work to be able to map all of these things to it to help people see the cause and effect relationships that you need to have. Well, terrific. I think, um, you know, for a lot of us in uh, the sales enablement profession, now is a great time to get your arms around understanding the overall spend, cataloging it, uh, and, and finding a friend in finance to be able to start <clears throat> to reallocate spend um, and drive commercial performance. You know, the goal of any company is to make a profit. And you got to start somewhere with the, the foundational facts around uh, these investments. So thanks to everyone who attended um, the call today. Thank you, Scott, for your thorough review of what has been a, uh, a topic you have uh, passionately uh, supported and driven for, for a decade. And uh, hopefully it's helpful to, uh, to everyone on the call. Uh, with that, um, if there's any, if there's not any other comments, Scott, I think uh, we'll just say thanks to everyone and have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much.